Um, thank you uh, to the organizers for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, but I have to say, to start with, that I'm rather here under false pretenses in the sense that I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a museum studies, I don't deal with material culture, but I do deal with culture, and I specifically, as a literary scholar, I deal with words, with discourses, and more generally with the question of how meaning is made. And so it's from this perspective that I want to address what was one of the, announced as one of the aims of this uh, uh, panel, which was to provide a better vocabulary for dealing with colonial durabilities. So I want to think about this notion of a vocabulary about words and practices and how words and practices relate to each other. And, and basically the main point I want to tell you is how words and practices are constantly influencing each other and changing so that we're dealing with a phenomenon in process. And my main focus, as my title suggests, will be about the question of apology, which above all is in the first instance a question of words. And I want to um, begin with a a very recent case, an event which took place exactly a week ago in Goose Bay on the island of Labrador in the far northeast of Canada. And I realize this proves to you that I, this is fresh material. On the other hand, it's a, it's a, a rather risky um, uh, uh, um, choice on my part since, of course, this is very recent and I haven't been able to look at in any great in-depth uh, at the, uh, the impact of this apology. But I think it nevertheless gives us a, a, uh, a good uh, starting point to get into some more general issues. Because what we're dealing with here is an apology, a formal apology offered by Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to the Inu, Inu, Inuit and Nunatu Kavut communities for the suffering caused by the system of residential schools, a system in place since the late 19th century, which meant that children have been taken away and submitted to physical, psychological, and often sexual abuse in the name of education. Trudeau's highly polished and carefully composed speech uh, lasted some 16 minutes and is alternated between English and French and was punctuated by moments of emotion, including some sniffing, which seemed to be to do with emotion, but also to do with a cold. So it got a bit complicated in terms of how you read the signals. And I, I say that, it sounds a bit trivial, but you have to realize that these things, what we call an apology, is actually based on a very embodied performance, and these things are, are part of it. Also, the ways in which it is being mediated, it's a mediated event, and my access to it was through the transcripts, but also through the, um, the, the CBC uh, broadcasting of it, which was very interesting in that it left out the audience responses, which was a very interesting choice in, in terms of the ways in which then this, um, the meaning of this event is being constructed. Um, so just to say that there's, it's, it's, there's, um, uh, we have to look at these events, and I'm still trying to work out ways how do you analyze such a complex event, but th that they are complex is evident. So I, but I'm just going to give su summarize the, 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 the core of it, and particularly what was said. Um, the Prime Minister began by acknowledging that the residential schools reflected a colonial way of thinking. And that this kind of thinking, and I quote from Trudeau, has no place in our society. It was unacceptable then, and it is unacceptable now. And this led then into the central point of the speech. Um, Today, I humbly stand before you to offer a long overdue apology to the former students. And then he lists the names of multiple schools on behalf of the government of Canada and all Canadians. And this formal apology was followed by some very carefully practiced lines, which presumably repeated the apology in one of the indigenous languages. And unfortunately, I hadn't yet had a chance to find out which one. But I know that, that this is, in the past, has been a really interesting aspect of these formal encounters. Note Trudeau's reference to the fact that this apology was long overdue. Um, and here, indeed, at one point, he actually apologizes for not having apologized sooner. We are sorry for not apologizing sooner, for not writing this wrong before now. This, of course, reflects the fact that recognition of the ills wrought by colonial thinking had indeed been a long time coming. 
but it's also a more specific reference to an earlier apology that now in retrospect is seen as having been incomplete. And I mean the high profile one offered by an earlier uh, Conservative Prime Minister Harper in 2008, which co coincided with a similar apology in Australia. And when Harper made his apology for the federal system of residential schools, he had explicitly excluded rather legalistically Labrador and Newfoundland in his speech, since technically they had only joined the Canadian Confederation in 1946 and the schools had been set up before there. Not surprisingly, people in Labrador and Newfoundland saw this as an act of denial of their grievances and hence as an insult added to injury. Um, and so we see that's one of the reasons why Trudeau went to great trouble to name every school and every community involved so as to ensure that the scope, that, that his apology more than made up for the shortcomings of the previous one. So we're, we're dealing here with a, a, an interesting sort of reiteration, this idea of repetition, which is something I'm going to come back to as a distinct from the idea of an apology is a once and for all uh, a historic epochal change. We see instead this principle of repetition is coming into it. And Trudeau's speech was followed by a 20 or a 10 minute long acceptance speech in English by Toby Obed um, on behalf of the survivors of the residential schools. And a year ago, the survivors in Labrador and Newfoundland had successfully brought a class action against the government, resulting in an, a, a compensation of $50, 50 million. But it would appear from Obed's extremely emotional speech, which was preceded by wild cheers from the public, so there's the first time you hear the presence of the public, that the apology was experienced somehow as a pinnacle of a much longer process. So we had phrases like, we did it, this is it, we got our apology, we got our apology. Now, Obed was careful to, to point out that he didn't actually speak for everybody. And significantly, the Innu community, one of the three communities addressed to whom the apology was offered, had actually refused in advance to accept it or even to attend the ceremony. And I want to come back to this refusal of forgiveness later on. But right now, the question I want to ask, what does it mean to get our apology that we did it, this is it? And the answer lies in the idea that a sequence of material and symbolic and legal practices can somehow affect a healing of old wounds and a working through of painful legacies. We could call this the reconciliation script, and here I'm picking up on a lot of what Margaret had just very um, uh, expertly set out for us, all of these different types of measures which have been emerged as part of a, a culture of, repar uh, re uh, of reparations. And so, uh, I would say that, th that this record, what I'm going to call here the reconciliation as script, emerged in the post-World War II period, along with a so whole set of strategies as outlined by Mar Margaret, reparations, um, memorializations, truth commissions, and so on. And behind, of course, the idea of reconciliation itself, is the idea that divided societies can be led through these strategies of remembrance to become whole again, which of course itself supposes that they were once whole and that like Humpty Dumpty is where they can be put together uh, again, which of course is not the case in terms of uh, colonialism. And a good, but, but nevertheless, we have this idea, this term reconciliation has, has, has become a, a very important, very dominant one. Uh, and and, and li linked to this idea of a script, of the sequence of, event, uh, of, of strategies which will lead to this reconciliation. And a good example of this I found in my own work is in relating to the Irish uh, Good Friday Agreement of 1998, which led, among other things, to the commissioning of a, a high-profile report that set out a roadmap for peace consisting of thir some 30 steps which would culminate at the end of a five-year period in all parties to the conflict signing a declaration to the effect that they will never again kill or injure each other on political grounds. This is an aspirational um, sort of direction to be uh, uh, worked towards, but clearly it's, it, it's very questionable whether you can actually set out and in five years on this particular day we'll all come together and we'll agree uh, to like each other. Um, 
but, I, but so we have this sort of paradox, and that's what I'm trying to, to, to get at here, the idea that, that there's been this emergence of certain strategies which are seen to be productive in terms of, of renegotiating social relations. At the same time, the idea that there is a difficulty in scripting them, that you cannot predict a certain outcomes. And you certainly cannot predict the idea of forgiveness, especially if you think of the idea of forgiveness along with Paul Ricoeur in terms of a gift something which is not part of a transactional logic of you do this, I do that. The gift is something which cannot be predicted. So here we have this paradox in, in relation to the idea of reconciliation, is that on the one hand you want to plan it, and the other hand that you cannot predict it by undermining this very notion of a new departure, a new departure which um, is, uh, if you like, reparation in the original sense of making ready again. Or you could think here of Hannah Arendt's idea of natality, the freedom which comes together with a new beginning. But this involves to, uh, stepping outside of that transactional logic. So what I want to explore here further is this tension between predictability and unpredictability with the idea of the same old story and new beginnings and, and link that into this question of the nature of apology as a particular practice as this has emerged, particularly in the, um, uh, uh, since around 1970 when uh, Willy Brandt famously went on his knees uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, which was conceived as an apology even though he actually never said anything, which is an interesting aspect of this whole notion of what is, constitutes an apology. Um, because strictly speaking, apology has to do with words and not just with gestures. Um, and strictly speaking, it's a, it's a performative speech act where words are used not just to describe the world, uh, that's what perform performativity means in speech act theory. You don't just use language to describe the world, but you use it to change the world. Um, uh, and, so, and so if the conditions are right, uh, apologies can perform a change by changing social relations. Uh, they have a transformative potential uh, to change and uh, by changing the relations between perpetrators and victims. And they do so by giving the latter the power to accept or reject the apology being offered, huh? right? Because it's a, it's a way of empowering the victim by giving them the right to refuse, not to forgive. And we've already seen that this idea of non-forgiveness has already entered into my story. Um, there have been, uh, uh, so, so those people who have advocated the, 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 the um, uh, usefulness of apology as, as a structure, um, or as a strategy, have seen in it uh, the potential to create new conditions for sharing the world, or for, as Melissa Nobles put it, for reconstituting the imagined community of the nation. Um, as uh, some ba Barkan puts it, they offer an opportunity not to change the past, but to change the ways groups and their members stand in relation to it. But there's others, of course, critics of apology, and most notably Michel Rolf Trouillot, who complained that public apologies can never be more than an abortive ritual that recycles Christian models of contrition and reinforces an us-them dichotomy. He would argue that apology best serves the interests of perpetrators as part of an international politics of regret um, that allows them to reassert their moral standing through public displays of remorse while continuing to ignore the ongoing legacy of historical injustice or the structural injustice that Catherine was talking about earlier. But what, however you see about the, 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 the advantages and disadvantages of, of apologies, there's no doubt that it has become um, a, uh, increasingly applied uh, in uh, reconciliation um, uh, uh, processes, not least uh, Trudeau, who since last week has already given another historical apology to the LGBT community in Canada. So he's, he's giving apologies left, right, and center. But he's doing so as part of a whole, this po international politics of regret, which just to go back to uh, 2015, since then we've had the Pope apologizing for the suffer of indigenous peoples in Latin America. We've had calls made for the Dutch state to recognize, to apologize for its failure to protect its Jewish minority during the Second World War. Calls were reiterated for the Dutch state to apologize for slavery, and this is where my um, 
uh, cartoon comes from. Sorry, but no, sorry, no apology. And uh, the story goes on into 2016 when the government of Taiwan apologized to its Aboriginal residents. So, so whether you like it or not, apologies are out there and they've become uh, increasingly, they've come to frame the encounters between historically imposed uh, parties. Uh, there's an idea, will there be an apology when, a, when an encounter is going to take place? So, uh, and dem so demands for a, a full apology are, are often made. Even though it's not clear, uh, what a full apology might entail. And one of the things that has struck me in my work uh, on uh, the practices of apologies is that there is um, uh, um, often um, a set, uh, there's a huge variety in what is seen as an apology and there's very often a case of being disappointed. Um, the offering party um, because, the, and, and I've argued that this is part of what, what you might call an, a structural asymmetry in apology. For, for the offering party, it's a way of uh, put, giving closure to the situation, putting the past behind us. For the receiving party, for the victims, it's seen as a way of opening up a new beginning, uh, which, if the apology is sincere, should also lead not just to a recognition of past injustice, but also to a redress of current uh, social uh, inequalities. Um, and it's this asymmetry which, to my mind, explains the, um, the, the, the uh, amount of disappointment which surrounds apologies. So on the one hand, the huge expectations, but you've also a huge amount of uh, disappointment. But out of this disappointment and the, out of the, the, the disfaction, the, the structural dissatisfaction with apology, I would like to argue that that in itself is the value of the apology, not so much in what it achieves in the short term, but rather the dissatisfaction, the sense of incompletion which it um, uh, generates. Okay, I see I'm going to skip a bit here. Um, and, and to explain that, let me just remind you the fact that, that as apology has a, uh, evolved as a practice, people are also learning to position themselves strategically in relation to these public performances of remorse and to use them for uh, performances of resistance. I mentioned earlier that the Innu com community last week overtly rejected in advance uh, Trudeau's apology. They did so because it wasn't inclusive enough. The argument was that there was uh, uh, Children have been mistreated elsewhere, beyond the residential schools. Um, but there was also because there was no reason to expect that Trudeau's apology as such would do anything to change the current conditions, the structural injustice in which indigenous children are growing up. And apparently, while, as, um, while Aboriginal children represent 7% of all children in Canada, uh, they accounted in 2011 for 48% of all those in foster care. So while Harper's apology to almost um, 10 years ago had aroused expectations that a turning point had been reached uh, and social justice was on the horizon, te by 10 years later, people have become ever more skeptical about such grand gestures and have developed strategies of resistance to a quick fix politics of regret. But there are also even more creative practices of resistance to the predictability of apology, which may be of particular interest to our discussion here. And I just want to flag here the work of uh, artist Kathy Busby, who in response to the 2008 apology, uh, created this set of installations in which she, she took and repeated, reiterated the apology, but then in this uh, uh, blown up form and focusing on the mouths of the prime ministers, both the Australian and the, and the Canadian, as they are making their apologies. In this way, as it were, estranging um, their, um, uh, the, the event and making people think about what happens after that moment of apology. Um, so here we see then uh, another example here. It's just traveled. And I just want to move finally to uh, uh, an artist I find very interesting is David Garneau, um, who in 2012 also created a, an artistic response to the 2008 apology, but also more generally to the ongoing politics of reconciliation in Canada. Um, and in the process, he uh, also offered a trenchant critique of the very idea of reconciliation as a restoration of an original unity. 
He points out, for example, that in the Cree language, uh, there is simply an, no equivalent for the word uh, uh, apology, so that in a sense, the thinking about the transformative function of an apology should begin with, with the language itself. Um, and so what he proposes to, to introduce a new word, um, not a new word in English, but a new word in this context, as a framework for uh, thinking about uh, how to move forward, and he used the word uh, conciliation. And conciliation, so not a, it's not a re-anything, it's a conciliation, it's a coming together. And he sees it as a coming together in what he calls uh, irreconcilable spaces of aboriginality. And he gives his own work, comments on his own work, of which you see a bit here, as, as an example of what he means by this irreconcilable spaces of aboriginality. This sense of an invitation to become part of uh, a... Um, <clears throat> a conversation, but at the same time to be made aware of the fact that you're not in on the conversation. And so he, he uh, proposes um, the um, uh, rethinking <clears throat> sort of reconciliation as conciliation and to think about different practices in which the art, arts as a way of, of, of using the imagination also to think beyond the present framework and the present verbal frameworks. And this is one of his comments, which I find worth quoting here. An apology and cash payments will not remove the stain. The essence of a conciliation project is individual transformation. Sharing in a discourse about history's responsibility and transformation among artworks and with other human beings is a corrective to the colonial desire for settlement. So I, I think what he's trying to get at here is the idea of this, the unsettlement of art, as it were, art as unsettling. But art as experienced, and this is where the museum comes in, is in a space for embodied encountered, as well as simply, as well as in a relationship to uh, an artifact. And so what he's proposing, I think, is the small, what Marianne Hirsch elsewhere calls small acts of repair, which uh, engage individuals uh, in, uh, in the engagement with, the, with other people and with the artworks, rather than these grand narratives of transformation, which are endemic to that, what I call, reconciliation uh, as script. So let me just conclude by um, making just very, very briefly three points, what I've been trying to show to you. Um, I'm arguing that we need, instead of just thinking about words in, in abstract, in just very sort of theoretical terms, as a cultural historian, I would uh, argue for the importance for always thinking about words and practices as embedded, embedded in contexts and contexts which are constantly shifting. Um, in shifting through in a, in a multi-directional way, but through contestation, and that this is part of this is part of cultures. Is this feedback mechanism, which is part of what, what which seems like as if we're constantly drifting away, but it's also a way of finding spaces for negotiation. Uh, and the second point is that. Uh, I, I would argue for integrating our reflection on, uh, on different practices, legal, political, curatorial, and artistic, so that they are literally part of the same space. Uh, and thirdly, and finally, uh, this would uh, be an argument for seeing the museum as, as this type of space, but rather to see it in terms of a space of conciliation rather than a space of reconciliation. Thank you. <laughs>